So this should not be news to y'all, um, but it might be helpful data for you to take back and share with some of your folks. Um, this shows the percentage of people in different uh, systems that have significant trauma. Um, so you can see from 98% of women who've been incarcerated um, to, uh, and it's surprising to me that the, that the low end, again, it's still high at 70%, are kids in foster care. So this is emerging research. But what some of the emerging research is showing us is that when you change the structure of the brain or the architecture of the brain, and that then creates chronic inflammation in the body from a very young age, and our cells are exposed to that chronic inflammation for a longer period of time, it literally changes our genetic structure. And we pass down our genetic structure to our children. And what the emerging research is showing is that if I have an A score of four, for example, when my daughter is born, she inherits my A score of four. So even if she is raised with zero trauma in her childhood, she still has those risk factors associated with having an A score of four. The other thing that's scary about this is people who don't heal from their high A score are much more likely to inflict trauma on other people, including their children. Y'all are all familiar with the hurt people hurt people, right? And so this, my child has a much higher risk of having an even higher ACE score than what she was born with. And so if you think about the exponential nature of what this research means, it's scary as hell. But for a lot of people, it also starts to answer the question of, why does it feel like it's just getting worse? Every year, it seems like it's worse. It's because we're passing down to our children the trauma of the past. Now, what we're trying to figure out is, When we heal from this trauma, does that undo that genetic change? And how long does it take? And what's the fastest way to do that so that we can start to put a dent into that transmission of trauma genetically? And so there's a lot of really cool research going on around that, and um, I'm excited about that. So this is where the presentation starts to have you feel a little bit less uncomfortable. I know, sorry. First thing in the morning, it's rough. Um, we know what the solution to adverse childhood experiences is. We, we know how to fix this. And it's called trauma-informed care. So at its core, Trauma-informed care changes the way we interact with kids and adults from a what's wrong with you to a what happened to you lens. Now, I mentioned I have two children. I guarantee you at some point in their growth and development, I said to them, what is wrong with you? <laughs> That's OK. We were, we're still learning. But if you think about it, it's logical, right? If the way that you interact with the kids who are acting inappropriately is to say what happened to you, 
that communicates to that child that you understand that the reason he is acting inappropriately is because his brain developed around fear and his behavior, oh my goodness, I'm gonna fall through a crack in the stage. His behavior, <laughs> y'all been afraid, right? Well, I was just afraid. <laughs> um, his behavior is the result of what happened to him. And so if we can start to have those conversations through that lens, that helps him, one, understand why he is feeling the way he's feeling and acting the way he's acting and communicates that you understand that and want to be that adult in his life who can help him figure out what to do about it. Now, all of us have known somebody who late in life had a stroke, right? And it's pretty miraculous to watch them day by day by day relearn some function that they lost as a result of that stroke. Now, they don't relearn all of it, but their brains are old, right? Kids' brains are developing until the latest estimate is age 26. When your brain is still developing is when it is most plastic. So when we're interacting with these kids and we're helping them process and heal from this trauma, it's not a lost cause. It is absolutely possible to help undo the wiring that occurred in the brain and rewire it back to normal and help these kids heal from their trauma. And I'm preaching to the choir here. Y'all wouldn't be at this conference, you wouldn't be doing the work you're doing if you didn't believe that. But we need other people to believe that because there are some people who think that these kids are lost causes and that they're beyond help. And that is absolutely not true. And every single one of you in this audience has a success story to debunk that myth. But what trauma-informed care does is it changes the systems that we have in place that our kids are part of. So the biggest mistake, and you heard my background is in public health. The biggest mistake that I think public health has made ever is this concept that they develop interventions, right? We develop interventions. We identify kids who could benefit from that intervention. We pull them out of their real world, put them into this intervention. We see success, and then we put them back into their real world that is exactly the same as it was before they left it, and we're surprised when the changes don't stick. What trauma-informed care does is it changes the system so that we don't have to pull kids out, we don't have to stigmatize them, we don't have to create artificial environments for them that then when they go back to the real world, they fail. Has anybody seen this documentary, Paper Tigers? All right, we got some diehard folks out here. So basically what Paper Tigers is is a documentary that followed an alternative high school for four years as they implemented trauma-informed approaches. And what they found was that at the end of these four years, and again, I, I would like to emphasize this is an alternative high school their suspensions dropped by 90%. They had zero kids kicked out of school. I don't know how many of y'all might work in an alternative high school, but that's got to be absolutely mind-blowing for you. The grades and the graduation rates surged. Now, this is the key point, regardless of ACE score, the kids thrived. And that's what trauma-informed care does, right? It creates a system 
where when kids act inappropriately, they're not disciplined with fear, where everybody is treated in a safe, stable, nurturing way. And regardless if a child had an A score of zero or an A score of 10, they all thrived in that environment. So we didn't have to pull anybody out and give them special treatment. Everybody got the same thing, but it was a good thing for everybody. So I'm going to talk about trauma-informed care, one more slide, but I also want to talk about other things that we can do to help kids create resilience. And this is where I like to um, get on a bit of a soapbox. So my first soapbox, you all kind of heard, but I was a little gentle this morning, so I'm going to be a little bit more in your face about my first soapbox. So my first soapbox is, in the United States, as a culture, we have been taught that if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. What this ACE research tells us is that that is a false narrative. You cannot discipline children with fear, especially children who are acting the way they act because they're afraid. So that's my first soapbox. My second soapbox is, Some people like to believe that they got where they are because they pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. And those people would have you believe that if they took their shoes off and showed you their feet, they have bootstraps on their feet. And that they were born with those bootstraps. And we know that's not true. We've all seen baby feet. Baby feet don't come with bootstraps. Resilience is developed. And if you're sitting in the audience today, very successful, in spite of your high ACE score, it's because somebody in your life helped you. You didn't do it all by yourself. And so we need to focus a little bit more on how we can help all kids develop resilience and not just go with that default, oh, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, American culturalism. So how do you do that? How do you help kids develop resilience? Because that is the ultimate goal of trauma-informed care. So of course, first we need to help kids not experience so much adversity, not experience so many adverse childhood experiences. And there are a lot of people in this room and there are a lot of people out in the community who are working with parents to help them understand um, how not to inflict trauma on their children. But at the heart, what these kids need is a safe, stable, nurturing environment. And they're not especially once they start going to school, in their house 24 hours a day. And so if their home environment can't provide that safe, stable, and nurturing experience for them, then every other place that they go can and should. And that's the concept behind trauma-informed care. We want to make sure that no matter where these kids go out in the world, they are met with a safe, stable, nurturing environment because that allows them to start to understand that what's happening in the home is an aberration. And when they start to understand that, that lets their brain start to process the fact that they don't have to be afraid all the time of everybody everywhere. There are some other really great things that kids can do and adults can do if they have high A scores and they're learning how to recenter and heal and, and retrain their brain away from that constant feeling of fear and anxiety. The number one thing on the list is getting enough sleep. And 
I, I feel like a bit of a hypocrite when I talk about getting enough sleep. Usually I'm pretty good. When I was a public health director, I was like, all right, if I'm gonna tell people to eat 17 vegetables a day, damn it, I'm gonna eat 17 vegetables a day. Um, I was at my, my uh, sister-in-law's house for a weekend and I was flossing my teeth and her husband, who's not a very healthy person, walked by and, and he said, damn, you like floss every day? And I said, well, yeah, I tell people they should, so I don't want to be a hypocrite. He's like, nobody would know. <laughs> so um, I will admit, I do not get eight hours of sleep every night. Adults need eight hours of sleep every night. If you want to function at your best potential, regardless of your ACE score, you need eight hours of sleep every night. And especially working moms, that's like entirely impossible. And my advice to you is this, your children don't care if you clean the bathroom every week. Only you care. So if it's a choice between going to bed at 10 o'clock or going to bed at 11 o'clock because you feel the need to clean the kids' bathrooms, don't do it. They're not gonna notice. I know, there's some applause there, yes. Um, Kids need nine to 10 hours of sleep. Parents, sometimes we like to think that we're giving our kids treats, right? We're letting them stay up late as a treat. It's really bad for them. Don't give your kids treats that are bad for them. Just like don't give your dogs treats that are bad for them. We're having an entire obesity epidemic with dogs now because y'all's kids have gone away and now you feel like you need to treat your dogs. Dogs don't need treats either, um, but I digress. Adults need eight hours of sleep. Kids need nine to 10 hours of sleep. It makes sense, right? If you have a high A score as a kid, you are not afraid when you are asleep. Your brain reprograms itself at night. And if you have a solid 10 hours of sleep as a kid every night, that's 10 hours of that day when your brain's not telling your body that it needs to be afraid. 